and welcome to UFC's Inside the Octagon. I'm John Gooden and alongside me, as always, is top UFC analyst Dan Hardy. So to close out 2016, UFC 207 is being blessed with not one, but two massive title fights. In today's show, we turn our attention to the bantamweights as Dominic Cruz looks to build on his incredible 12-fight win streak and once again defend the belt. But he faces a strong challenge from upcoming Team Alpha Male powerhouse Cody Garbrandt, undefeated and hungry to take the belt from the champion. Also, we look at the fight kicking off the main card as former bantamweight champ TJ Dillashaw and John Hands of Stone Lineker go head-to-head -head in a potential title eliminator in what promises to be an absolute barn burner. OK, well, let's take a look at the title fight first and foremost. Dominic Cruz versus Cody Garbrandt. Look at the clinch. Someone's excited for so this. Excited. Well, I was excited, but I have to say I was slightly intimidated <laughs> in trying to analyse Dominic Cruz because he's a bit of a master at footwork and movement. However, we got you, Dan. I'll do what I can. Okay. I'll do what I can. Good stuff. Well, <laughs> looking at a couple of these stats, then, I mean, there's a reach advantage here for Cruz. Outside of that, this just shows that he's been around a very long time indeed. Mixes it up well and a, and a very high number of takedowns. Yeah, but very, very different fighters in their own right. Obviously, Cody Garbrandt has come into the UFC and has just been starching guys left, right and centre. I mean, he has a very supernatural power that he's able to connect with people over and over again. And that's got to be a real concern of, of Dominic Cruz going in because it's a 25-minute fight. He's got to stay away from that power for the full five rounds. Dominic Cruz, on the other hand, is you know he's such a well-established fighter and a veteran and a pioneer of these lighter weight classes, and has effectively rewritten the rules around footwork and energy systems, which we'll discuss in a second. Okay, so never tasted defeat, 90% knockout ratio. That is Love impressive. <clears throat> One thing I also want to say about this is the history between Dominic Cruz and Team Alpha Male, Team Alpha Fail, yep. as Dominic <laughs> says, not me, which is quite interesting because yeah. Cody seems like the kind of guy that gets a little agitated, if I may be so brave as to say so. He does. Uh, and it's been, this has been coming along a little while. I think that uh, Cruz was analysing, or he was on the Fox desk for the Mizugaki fight, and I think he might have said a few things that Cody didn't like. So this has been coming to from a simmer to a nice gentle boil as yeah. we get closer to this fight, which has made it very entertaining as well. It has. You know, Cody's a very emotional fighter. We saw that on the season of The Ultimate Fighter when he was having to deal with McGregor over and over again yes. and didn't deal with that very well. Um, very emotionally invested in all of these fights, and that's partly where his power comes from. What is interesting about this and about the, the connection with Alpha Male and the drama between Dominic Cruz and the team is that now the landscape has effectively opened up. Uriah Faber's just retired. Dillashaw's moved to a different team. So now Cody Garbrandt has nobody, no teammates standing in his way. That's a very good point. And he can just charge straight at, to, yeah. at Dominic Cruz. It's, it's good for a person like him to have a sole focus. Yeah. And to be honest, I think if it wasn't uh, the world title, he'd be calling out Dillashaw. So yeah. that's, an, that's an interesting matchup yeah, for the absolutely. future as well. Okay, well, let's take a look at the champ. <sighs> let's take a look at him. There he is, all confident. We've got to love the Dominic Cruz. And his footwork has really, really changed the game. A lot of people are trying to mimic this footwork. We see guys like Ross Pearson spends a lot of time with him and try to pick up on some of that. But just look how relaxed he is and how good his balance is. I mean, Uriah Faber is able to ground most fighters. And Dominic Cruz has always been an issue for him. He's able to scramble, keep his hips loose and fluid. So Uriah is never able to get a good purchase on. And then when he decides he's taking a fighter down, his level changes like lightning. He times it perfectly, he sees people attacking, rushing forward, and look at this defensive work against probably the fastest fighter in the division. Keeps his head out of the way, slips around to the back and locks a nice body lock on, and then starts to throw him around. I'm not suggesting he's going to be able to do that against Garbrandt, because he's a considerably bigger fighter than Mighty Mouse. But it just goes to show that Dominic Cruz is that unpredictable entity in the octagon, even as a champion, which is unusual, because usually when we see a person get to the championship level, they start to close off and limit their skill set. Dominic Cruz is one of those guys that will always throw something unusual out there. And watch this. As soon as Dillashaw scrambles back to his feet, as a great wrestler as he is, the one thing he doesn't expect is a second level change straight away. Yeah. And just the speed in which he can do it. And it's not a it's not a dominant power wrestling game. He doesn't grab people and you know clamp on them and slam them to the floor. It's a very loose, fluid game where he's very good at in the moment spotting where their bases are and stripping them away. You know, it's, it's lovely to watch him work, and it's, it's such a very relaxed and fluid style, which plays into his, his, his use of his energy systems as well. 
it's something that we spoke about before and, and other people have noticed. You, you'll see him after a brief flurry, he'll step back and he'll do his little dance on the spot and he'll go, <sighs> and you think to us for a second, oh, the champion's tired. But then, you know, he continues on hard for five rounds and doesn't slow down. That's and, purposeful. He's, he's gone out and said yeah. he does that for a reason. Well, I mean, this, this is very interesting to see because it's been quite organic for him. He seems to have been doing it early on in his career. You go back and watch his last loss against Faber, you'll see him doing it in the first round of that fight. So it's something that he's picked up organically and he seems to have adapted very well to suit him. And now other people are going, well, it's working for him and he's dominating, so I'm going to start trying these things myself. So he's influencing the whole sport. It's, it's, it's a fascinating thing to watch. Dominating. 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 <laughs> One thing before we move on to Cody. So he looks like he's... Unless he's striking, he looks like he's dancing. Yeah, he does. He's so fluid. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very nice movement. It is. So, one thing that Cruz has said is he kills hype for a living. Yep. We're about to see the hype. We are, and there aren't many people in the UFC more deserving. And I was still, I was still a little reserved about Garbrandt until he fought Almeida, who was one of my favourites, and is one of my favourites. But if we go back and look at his fights, this is the only fight he's had go the distance against Briones, and it was a good, concise performance. He didn't slow down at any point throughout it. He never looked tired. And we saw a lot of, a lot of takedowns from him, particularly in the first round, which we've not really seen a great deal of. And they're very, they're, they're good timing, he's got good top position, but they, they, it's much more of a power base of takedowns. I mean, watch this, watch how he just lifts his legs to the side. It's almost like he's got enough strength to not worry too much about technique. So you just gotta think, now people are talking about Cody Garbrandt, we've never seen him go five rounds. If you finish that strong with that kind of hand speed, we've gotta assume that he's got another two rounds in the tank. I mean, I, I wouldn't question it. And then when he goes on to fight Mendez, he started using this step through. So let's just have a look at that step through because it's something that we've seen Faber do. We saw Dillashaw doing it a lot when he was training at Alpha Male all the time. And it's a, it, so he allows his, he, he punches and then steps his legs through. It's almost like he's allowing the momentum to carry him forward. But what it does is it, it, it switches him into a, a, into a southpaw stance and then back to an orthodox stance, which allows him to shift his weight from one to the other. So the right hand comes over, right leg steps up and then that, that allows the shift in power into That's the... That's always a power so punch. So it's always a power punch, exactly. And he's always moving forward. And when you've got guys see, see someone that's flurrying forward with a lot of power like that, what do they do? They back up, they move away, their chin comes up, because these are the instinctual things that we do when we're under attack. So then Cody Garbrandt there, you see, he, he recognised the opportunity on the low kick, and then when, when Mendes goes to throw the low kick again, same thing again, runs forward with big power punches, kind of like Woodley does. Three punch combination, yes. and the last one's the big power punch that puts them out. It's so difficult to stop that forward momentum that you have to work around it. Now, if you dominate Cruz, you've got several options. You can dance around it, you can make him chase you, or yeah. you can level change underneath it, which are the two things that Garbrandt's got to watch out for. Yeah, Cruz, can, he never takes a step back. He's no. always an angle off. A lot of people may take one step and angle off. He doesn't even do that. No. But Garbrandt, for me, even his haircut is fierce. You know, <laughs> he brings the heat, for yeah, sure. he does. And he always fixes it as well between, between combinations. Just watch out for that. Well, yeah, it's important, right? <laughs> this is an entertainment business as well, apparently. True, true. Um, and talking of entertainment, I've been very entertained by the questions that we've had. Yeah, we so always get good questions. Let's take a look at what we've got. And oh, uh, let's... Fresh MMA. Fresh MMA. So, will Cruz be able, and that's so appropriate yeah. when you freshen up in between strikes, will <laughs> Cruz be able to stay away from the knockout power of Cody for 25 minutes? Well, no one's been able to solve the riddle, really. No, no. What do you reckon? Well, Briones. They've had a good look for yeah, a while. Yeah, they have. I mean, team. Briones was able to stay away from it for 15 minutes, but he still got caught with it. We still got caught with a massive uppercut and, and was dropped and was able to recover, but. It's a question that we don't know. The problem is when you're fighting a guy that has this amount of power in their hands, they only need that one shot. And you know, we know that Dominic Cruz gets clipped as he moves. He's got a very high risk style, but because it's unpredictable, he gets away with a lot of things that most guys wouldn't. But at, at the same time, when he's shifting his weight across in front of an opponent, his head comes into range all the time. Mm. And all he's got to watch out for is as he's shifting, Cody Garbrandt doesn't just start throwing. Given the confidence that he has in his hands and he knows he's got power, all he needs to do is connect with one shot and that can shift the fight in his momentum into his direction. So Dominic Cruz has to possibly change the way he's going to approach this by not moving across in front of him in punching range like he would do against someone like Faber who doesn't have that bang knockout power that, that Garbrandt has. Okay, uh, let's take another look at Cruz then. 
OK. Again, Dominic Cruz. There are so many elements that make up his game, but the angles is one thing that really sets him apart, and it's one thing that is going to cause Cody Garbrandt problems because he likes that forward momentum. And if he does use that forward momentum, he's very good at spotting those individual shots. Now, Faber was lucky he was moving fast enough to get past that punch at his full power. But even on his comeback, even when, when we'd not seen him in the octagon for a year or so, a couple of years, was it, yeah, by this point? Years, I think. He came out against Mizugaki and just dominated him, and it was timing on the takedown that found him into this advantageous position where <laughs> Mizugaki was just never able to get out of it. I mean, these weren't shots that are going to put somebody out unconscious with the first one. But every single one of these, you can see it shocking him, and he's trying to adjust, and he can't. And at the same time, Dominic Cruz has got him pinned into the fence while he's hitting him. Very, very smart movement, very intelligent awareness of where he is in the octagon and how he can move around people. And watch this movement backwards as well. Even when he's up against the fence, he can land good clean shots. Watch this slow motion. So it looks wild, but then he'll throw a straight shot in which will upset his opponent's balance and send them back, which will allow him time to reset, and then you'll see him move across. He uses that momentum, then he moves across again. It's a lovely flow. It's, like it's a so loose, flow, it's so it? nice, you know. And, and this is another thing as well I want you to take a look at, I mean, and just look at how much distance he covers here. Do a little bit of homework and go and watch his last fight against Uriah Faber. At the end of the third round, you'll see this is, this is the fourth round now. This is where Faber started to slow down a bit. The frustration started to kick in. At the end of the third round, you'll see Dominic Cruz walk up to Faber and just walk into him at the end of the round. And you see immediately Faber gets angry and pushes him away. There's a spike in his heart rate. There's a tension in his body, which then doesn't allow him to rest in between rounds. Interesting. As soon as the fourth round starts, Dominic Cruz is straight on him. Immediate pressure. Go and watch it, you'll see for yourself. So not only is he very good at using the time within the rounds to his advantage, but he's also very good at manipulating the time out of the rounds, which is why we see the, the psychological impact that he has on these guys going in. Always picking at them, you know, going at them. You know, when they were on air the other week, um, at the last show, going back and forth and trash talking. Just Dominic Cruz, he stays calm, he stays constant, everything's yeah. well worded, but he just constantly puts things in your head that you have to listen to. And he breaks people down with it. And let's, let's just talk about that manipulation, the, the, the psychological warfare, and the fact that he was on Fox very recently, like last week, whilst Cody Garbrandt is preparing for him in the gym. Mm -hmm. Garbrandt's recognised this. Now, I don't know if he's taken this as how dare you go and work when you should be preparing for me, or ha, 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 you should be preparing for me, but you're actually working. Now, you break down fights. How difficult would it be to appear on a Fox desk, do a good job, when you've got a fight coming up in a couple of weeks? Can you balance that? Well, I don't see, why. I don't see it being a problem for Dominic Cruz. I mean, you know, he's, he came back, he's been working as an analyst for the past couple of years now. He's, you know, his last two fights have, have been while he's been sitting in this role on, on the Fox desk, so it doesn't seem to be affecting him. Okay. I mean, I've noticed real benefits in stepping away from the sport and being an analyst and how much we learn. And with an analytical mind like Dominic Cruz and, and the, the ability to integrate new things into his game, it's only a benefit for him to be watching as much MMA okay. as possible. All right, it was just something that Cody said in an interview, so I thought point. I'd get yeah. your, your uh, thoughts on that. So let's take a final look at Cody, and one thing I want to say is I think it's fantastic that he always comes out with young Maddox as well. Yeah, that is and, great. And uh, he was said he's very much doing. This is their title, so he he has that mo that sidekick motivator as well <laughs> as everything else. It's another little bit of pep in his step yeah. uh, with this young fellow who has come through a terrible disease and, and is still with us. So uh, yeah. let's take a look at this guy. Then he's got some power. He has. If Cody Garbrandt, if Cody Garbrandt's going to win this fight, this is the playlist that's going to define how. So this is the fight against Bionis. Bionis was the only fighter that's managed to go the distance, but that uppercut knockdown just devastated. I mean, how he managed to recover from that was, was very surprising. But immediately after, as he's recovering, Garbrandt was aware that he was turning in, he was recovering, and was able to get out. And this is something else I want to talk about. Now, and I talk about this a lot because I'm a big fan of this. If you catch somebody with a clean shot, and look how short that right hand is that he's landing there. It's all shoulder moving into that which I'll discuss in a second with the Almeida fight. What I want to talk about here is when he lands a clean shot, he's very good at seeing his targets and picking them off as his opponent's already hurt. A lot of people you'll see, they're rushing and they go crazy. This is excitement. I've got a knockdown yeah. now, I need to try Even to the point where they're not even looking where they're hitting, they're just flurrying and looking at the referee. It's my pet hate. I hate it. What I love about Cody Garbrandt is that he'll land a clean shot, he'll knock you out and then he'll go, there's your chin. 
bang, and he'll land another one, two, three clean punches with no wasted energy or effort. And he's not focused on the referee, he's focused on finishing his opponent. So watch this, so he lands his short right hand. Watch the follow-up shots. Now, you're gonna, you're gonna throw an uppercut here, which just glances, but it's on target. Then he goes right hook to the chin, right hook to the temple, and then a hammer fist right on the tip of his chin. It's just, most people, when, when this adrenaline hits and when they get that excitement, they don't pick those shots. Cody Garbrandt is not that person. He knows his power, he knows his opportunity. And this was a fight which I really struggled to pick. As I said, Almeida's one of my favorites. But look at that knockout and watch how Garbrandt steps into it. You see that? See how short that right hand is that he yeah. throws? See, we look at Garbrandt and we think, oh, he's got big power, he throws big, long, sweeping punches that knock people out. The truth is the power punches that knock people out are very short range shots. And as he's got, as he's got Almeida backed up against the fence here, you can see him, he readies it. It's cocked, ready. And he sidesteps, he steps across to launch that big power punch. So watch as he moves into this. Let me just pull it back a second so you can see the wind up. His so amateur you, boxing career has really served him well. Obviously got his basics down and he's just refined it yeah, for the game. Four exactly pounds that. gloves as well, it's a nightmare for his opponents. Right, exactly. You land, some, land on the chin with them and it's, it's, it's good night, especially if you've got the power that Garbrandt has. So look how, this, look how he's stepping in with this. He's cocked this, he's ready, he's looking for that opening. He sees the opening in there and he can see that Almeida's covering. So he's biding his time, he's waiting for the opportunity. And as he steps across, Almeida shifts to get out of the way and boom, opens up his chin for a very short, powerful right hand. And Almeida's one of the best strikers in the UFC, in my opinion. Yeah. He's got beautiful Muay Thai, but you just can't resist that kind of power. And this is the situation that, that uh, Dominic Cruz has got to watch out for. When he's trying to use that footwork to find space, like he did against Dullashaw, when he gets backed up against the fence, and he's using his good head movement to catch them and circle off, Garbrandt will just find that single shot. So the less time Dominic Cruz spends against the fence, the better for him. Out in the center of the octagon where he's got to, where, he, where he's, he's forcing Garbrandt to chase him around and try and land big power punches is where he wins this fight. If ever there was a, an appropriate way to apply changing of the guard, it could well be this fight. It could well be, it could well be. Especially with the run that Dominic Cruz has been on. And he still looks like he could continue holding oh, for that belt sure. for, you know, for, for uh, you know, several more years. But there's no denying that this new wave of talent that are coming through are a bigger threat than anybody he's ever faced before. Yeah. You know, and, and, and Cody Garbrandt is a good opposite, good example of these young up and coming fighters that have this potential. Yeah, Garbrandt has said, you know, I'm all about the title. And, and Cruz has said the title, he doesn't need the title no. to make him happy. <laughs> Just some very interesting things that I remember reading about over the last couple of years. So yeah. I'm not saying that that is any less motivation for him to remain champion. It's just something to, to keep in mind. Yeah. Now, it's a big night for the Bantamweights. There's another huge fight on the hang card. On, hang on. This is the deserving one. Go on, pull the stats up. Yeah. This is the fist clench one. Another fist clench one? Okay. Right. Oh, what a fight this is. <laughs> what a fight this is. It is, but it's oh. one that TJ Dillashaw was not happy about. I, I wouldn't be happy fighting him. Look at it. Well, I don't think it's anything to do with him necessarily. <laughs> I think it's the fact that Garbrandt the got the title yeah. shot and he didn't. Now, he's got to face him. Yeah. And, uh, okay, I, if I'm honest, I think John Inica's very lucky to, to have been treated as he has done by the UFC. Yes, he's exciting and the fans want to see him competing, but he's in this way five times yeah, yeah you know he, he's disappointed a lot of his opponents um, and I'm sure himself and his team but bantamweight is where it's at and boy did he go, do a good job in his last fight scary very very scary individual I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of John. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of both guys I love TJ Dillashaw because for me especially when he was the champion he was almost like the upgraded version of Dominic Cruz then to see Dominic Cruz come back and to kind of rewrite that footwork again has now put Dillashaw in an interesting situation, especially now introducing what was a teammate and is now effectively the number one contender in his yeah. division. That's got to spur him on and motivate him. And then to have someone like John Lineker, who is coming out of nowhere, just stepped up to the division and looks scary in, in the process. Yeah. It, there's a lot at risk for Dillashaw in this yeah. one, and there's so much to gain for Lineker. Yeah, just want to say one thing. So we've got the stats uh, for Lineker from his flyweight uh, tenure, because obviously he's not done as much work as a bantamweight, but, let, let's just think about that for a minute. He's achieved these knockdowns as a flyweight. Yeah. Now, I don't know about, is it not more difficult to get a knockdown as a flyweight 
There's, because they're just a bit smaller, don't carry as much well, weight and power. The problem that I would say at flyweight is it's far more difficult to hit the guys because they're quicker. Yeah. The other thing points. as well is that you've got to think. I mean, he missed weight at bantamweight in his last fight, only by a pound. But it, it, regardless, he missed weight. He missed weight at flyweight what four times? Yes. So he was been, depleting yeah. himself every one of those times to make the weight class, and was still able to carry that power over. Yeah. So then going up to a weight class that allows him an additional ten pounds will put him in a situation where he's not depleting himself as much, so he can generate even more power if yeah. he needs it. Yeah. I, I hope he can get all of these elements together because he's he's so exciting to watch. Yeah. Uh, but let's look at T.J. Dillashaw. Then. Okay. Well, like I said. A big fan of TJ Dillashaw, obviously a product of, of Alpha Male to start with, and then Dwayne Ludwig, who is you know, a, a, one of my favorite fighters of all time. But Dillashaw's got this real edge of creativity about him, which we see in a lot of his fights. He's got good basic jiu-jitsu, but he can also take a risk in clamp onto Vaughn Lee's back, for example, and finish with a nasty face bar in this one. And this just shows you the kind of torque that he can generate in his upper body. You can see all the muscles in his upper back, rhomboids, the trapezius, the latissimus dorsi, all squeezing down to clamp onto the neck and the face. I don't know what face, you just said for the sound And then this against Joe Soto was one of, the favorite, one of my favorite combinations he's thrown. Look at that. You see how his footwork moves. Uh, sorry, we're gonna have to go back. I wanna watch that again. Happy to watch that again. W watch his footwork as he's, as he's throwing this punch combination, which is probably five, six, seven punches. I've not counted, to be honest but he does it to effectively scoot Soto into the fence where he can corral him for that big head kick. So watch this. Watch, it, watch, his, watch how his body moves and his feet support him. Really good footwork, bang Muay Thai 101. Someone that can switch his stance and hit as they're doing it, beautiful. Now he's a southpaw, he's gonna switch, step through into an orthodox stance, and now obviously he's got Joe Soto trapped up against the fence, He's got two options, which way does he go? If he goes this way, Dillashaw's got a big left hook waiting for him, but he chooses to go the opposite way. And because he's been caught with a punching combination and thinks he's out of range, he drops his hands for a second, take a breather, and that's what catches him with a big head kick. And then followed up, look at that beautiful target in there. Straight down the pipe, no messing about, straight through the chin, and the foot is connected as well to the back. So it's, it's a full power punch. He's not pulling any, anything out of that. And Joe Soto, fair play to him for taking the fight on short notice, and he got through to the fifth round against the world champion. But that was the element that changed it entirely. That was just that ability to circle him onto a dangerous kick. And you can see him wait there. There's just a step where he's waiting for him to step out so he can catch him across the cranium with that shin. This is gonna be important for him, I think, keeping his head moving as he's moving forward. Now, obviously he had all kinds of problems with Dominic Cruz, and it wasn't until he started to land low kicks that he really started to have a visible effect, in my opinion. He left it too late in the fight by this point, but if he can maintain this with Lineker, who is notorious for planting his feet and digging in yeah. before he throws, take some of that power away from that front leg and it's gonna make his forward progression more difficult. I say it all the time, I'm a big fan of low kicks. Destroy the base of a human being mm. and it takes away their movement. And if he backs him, backs him up against the fence and Lineker starts to get tired, we know he can uncork a massive combination and be good at keeping his head out of danger as he's doing it. He's got a lot of tools here that can cause Lineker all kinds of problems. There's no doubt about it. The bottom line is that Lineker has hands of stone, and I can't think of anybody that's more deserving of their nickname. I mean, it's just even just the way he carries them. Should we get straight into this next playlist? I think we should. Yeah, well, let's do it. I mean, thing, but why do people just pause it a second? So one thing I can't understand is people who fight in what I like to call like the crab style. Yeah. What is it about their style that invites people to try and play their game? Everyone is fought. You would think try and just keep them at range, but they don't. No. They all just sit on their base and they're like, OK, I'm going to try and beat you at your own game. And he's got a great chin as well. It's an amazing chin, partly due to the fact that he's got a short, thick neck and big trapezius to support And he's about it. just about this tall. Exactly, yeah. I think one thing, it, it, and well, you've got to think, if you've got someone that's standing in front of you that's not giving ground, you've got two options. You either stand or you run away. Right. In MMA, we've got the other option of level change in which, in this circumstance and in many circumstances, you'll see him wrap a very tight guillotine. But if someone's standing in front of you, in your head you're going, well, he's there to be hit, so I should try and hit him. And then he just waits for you to go, OK, come on, try and hit me. And right. Bang, bang, starts so clubbing very you. much a baiting style. It almost. may be. I just think it works in his favour that he's sure. got a good chin and that's his style. But it's all about narrowing the options of his opponents. So when they do level change, like Uncle Creepy did, look at that lock he gets on that clamps down and doesn't let go of it, and Uncle Creepy does a hell of a job of scrambling to get out of this. 
but Lineker has always got that guillotine threat. He submitted Rivera with it as well, so we know it's dangerous. We know it's a tool that he can use. And it was only because Ian McCall had great submission defense he was able to get out of that. But then you find yourself back in this situation where he's got a fist fight with this guy. And does he want that? Of course he don't, because he clubs him like this. And this is where Lineker loves the fight. He loves that gunfight where he just stands yeah. in range and goes. You know, great defense against Rob Font here. Great scramble to get back to his feet. Again, something that's going to be useful against Dillashaw because I'm sure Dillashaw is going to try and make this as much of a mixed martial arts fight as possible. And as little as this as possible. <laughs> I mean, look at this. He's so confident in his hand, his hand speed and his hand power and his chin that he'll take this risk with anybody. And one thing I want to watch, well, I want you to watch out for is he always starts his combination with that. He always starts the combination with a right hook to the body, left hook to the head. And it seems as he steps and he plants his feet, he digs them, there we go, right hook, left hook. And then after that, who knows what's going to happen, but mm. usually he's going to just flurry from one punch to another. Right hand, left hook. It seems to be a very comfortable combination for him. Here it is again, you're going to see it on the knockdown of Michael McDonald here. Amazing power. And mm. again, Michael McDonald, another young up and coming fighter that has a lot of potential, just not quite hit his groove yet. But watch this, watch how Lineker steps in. And this is, this is my favorite clip. I'm going to slow this down so you can see it. So here we go. So they're in the trade now. Michael McDonald is, tr is, is trying to get off the fence. So he's going to break and he's going to move away. Lineker immediately cuts him off, immediately starts stalking towards him. But watch, as he steps into range, it's almost like, you're, you're, you know this as a triathlete, it's almost like when a cyclist puts their feet into the pedals, into the, what they're the, called, cleats. The cleats yeah. yeah. It's almost like he walks up and he goes, right foot, left foot, right hook, left hook. Yeah. It seems to be a program for him. So as he's walking forward here, you'll see him plant, almost dig his toes in. One, two, right hook, left hook. Look at that. It's a, it's a devastating combination, and, and it seems to be that that's how he plants his feet to throw it with full power. Plants, not even interested in what's coming back. Ate that hook mm. right on the chin, shook it off, not interested. Because his feet are planted, he's got a thick neck and a strong chin, yeah. and hands of stone. And watch how he carries them as well. When the fight starts, you'll notice most people, they'll stand in a boxing stance, however they stand. Lineker literally carries his hands mm. like kettlebells. Right. He walks forward like they're actually heavy. So you can guarantee when he lands one, you're going to feel it. Well, I think physically as well, he kind of turtles his head. It yeah. sort of sinks below, yeah, his <laughs> neck and his shoulders. So a lot of stuff glances up off of those muscles and protects him a little bit. Yeah. What a fight. I'm so excited about this one. I, I, I love these two guys, and they're so, they're so different. They it, are, although know. there's a, a bit of symmetry in the way that they work. TJ Dillashaw can do everything that he can with one side of his body, and but everything's connected. And yeah. then I guess uh, John Lineker is symmetrical in... The power on this hand yeah. and a power of this hand. Yeah, th that seems to be one thing. There is no discrepancy in, in a, does he have a powerful left hook or a powerful right hand? Yeah. He's just got heavy hands. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what he lands or the angle in which he lands it. And then Dillashaw it doesn't matter whether he attacks from the left or from the right. Or up or down. Or do, or he can do wherever. all of that. Yeah. <laughs> really exciting. What a bunch of great bantamweight yeah. fights we got. Well, that wraps up Inside the Octagon for 2016. Thank you for supporting and contributing to this show after the last 12 months. We really appreciate it. It has been a phenomenal year in the UFC. We've had unbelievable action, incredible stories, surprise results, and historic performances. We will be back ahead of UFC 208 as the UFC makes its debut in Brooklyn, New York. So make sure to come back for that one. From all of us here at Inside the Octagon, thank you once again. Happy New Year and cheers for watching. That loss, we have barely seen Rhonda. What's the Rousey's plan? What's she doing? You have to talk to her. It's not consistent with who you promoted yourself to be. Is that about losing, or is that about losing the mystique and the image that you worked so hard to create?